Let me come to you immediately. You just heard uh, what uh, my colleague uh, Margaret had to say about this very, very important uh, position at the UN. Why should there be controversy, especially given that uh, the African continent has endorsed him until the time for the African continent? And of course, as you saw, no one even tried to oppose him in that 38th floor building. In what happened? It's um, a very interesting scenario that is unfolding. Uh, there are various stakeholder interests, and I think we should recognize that. Uh, some stakeholders, of course, will look at it uh, from the point of pro-Africanism, that mm -hmm. this is one of their sons who's now president of the UN General Assembly. Mm -hmm. However, there's also the constituency of uh, other public uh, interests such as NGOs, for example, lobbyists, mm -hmm. uh, human rights activists who might raise issues about what is going on domestically in Uganda and attributing that to Mr. Kutesa. Mm -hmm. However, the position of president of the United Nations General Assembly uh, has nothing to do with representation of Uganda. A person is chosen in his own individual private capacity. So he's not there as an ambassador of Uganda. He's there in his own right. We have to understand that very well. Secondly, the president of the General Assembly of the United Nations has no voting rights in the uh, General Assembly. He's a symbolic ceremonial figure, although the position is prestigious. Mm -hmm. His role is more akin to what, uh, drawing an analogy, one would say, for example, the Speaker of the National Assembly. He's a custodian of the rules of procedure of the General Assembly. That's his fundamental role. And he has no right or power to interfere in the decision-making process of the General Assembly. So his powers are very limited. He's more of a ceremonial figure. They are really very symbolic, if you will. That's true. Because the last time I checked, the job of the UN General Assembly really is about engaging in debates. Right. It the, really makes very important decisions, really. Yes, the UN uh, General Assembly is uh, the main deliberative body charged with responsibility for policy making, mm -hmm. uh, so to speak. Uh, and each member country has one vote. And uh, the UN, uh, the General Assembly president, as I uh, indicated earlier, as uh, president of the body has no right to vote. Uh, mm -hmm. He only facilitates the discussions. Mm -hmm. And behind him are 21 uh, vice presidents. And uh, if you look at the way the, the structure of uh, the General Assembly, the way it's, it's done under the uh, rules of procedure, the General Assembly can actually formulate its own rules, which are ever sort of in a nebulous developing phase. Mm -hmm. uh, so w the General Assembly has a lot of discretion to devise or develop new rules as, as it's going on. And no member, no member state, for example, of the five permanent uh, members of the Security Council can put forward a candidate as president for the General Assembly. Correct. Okay, and um, of course the five member states can have membership as under the vice, uh, can have representation under the vice presidents, the 21 vice president. But none of those can act as president in the absence of the incumbent. So there are some safeguards which have been built into the system to ensure that, you know, everything runs smoothly. Why is the position characterized by some as a hardly noticed yet crucial job? I think, again, it comes back to what Margaret pointed out. Uh, the main chief executive officer of the United Nations, to put it that way, is the Secretary General. The CEO. The CEO. The, who's, that's the main CEO. Uh, like I pointed out earlier, the President of the General Assembly is more of a ceremonial titular figure, more like the Speaker of the National Assembly or Parliament. You know, when he's in Parliament, he does not represent uh, a constituency like an elected member of Parliament. So he has no right to vote. He only has to ensure that the rules of procedure in Parliament are observed and the Parliament conducts its roles effectively. So that's really the best analogy if you have to look at the General Assembly. I see. Well, uh, let me come again. Uh, so you said basically that um, as far as Kutesa is concerned, really, he doesn't frankly have to worry whether or not he has been tried on the allegations from somewhere. That is not his responsibility. It's not his responsibility. There are two things. We need to distinguish between the political discourse and the legal discourse. 
Much of the arguments are political arguments. They are not legal arguments. Mm -hmm. On a legal basis alone, he's on firm ground. But if you bring in politics and all these ideological issues, it right. becomes a different ballgame. Right. And the same thing occurs when you look at his election. He was unanimously elected. Uh, and also, again, if you look at the role of the, the president of the uh, General Assembly, um, like Dr. Jonah pointed out, I did indicate earlier on that the rules of procedure in the UN General Assembly are evolving rules. Mm -hmm. And the body can set new rules as it's sitting right there and then, which might change the, where the game is played. So the, you know, it, it, the, the powers of the president of the General Assembly can evolve depending on the rules which are prevailing at the time. And we, we need to distinguish what in international law, for example, drawing an analogy we call state practice on the one hand, customary international law and treaty law. The rules of procedure are like treaty law, but you have state practice and customs which have evolved over time, mm -hmm. different presidents doing certain things depending on their personality and their powers. Mm -hmm. So, but that is not really part of the rules. I see. It's a practice that has evolved. I see.